Omicron is still causing a lot of concern for students and parents with regard to schools. The U.S. is starting to see some hope, though, as cases are falling in 40 states and territories now. This comes as Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine, now called Spikevax, received full approval from the FDA for people 18 and older. Let's talk about this more. Dr. Alok Patel, physician at Stanford Children's Health, joining us now. Well, we just mentioned, uh, Alok, that Moderna became the second vaccine to receive full FDA approval in the U.S. So let's start there. How crucial is this? Well, good morning. Good afternoon. Sorry, Kira. And I just want to start out by <laughs> saying that Spike Vax is literally the coolest vaccine name ever. So that, that <laughs> hopefully will just get more people reading about this also. I think it's interesting that Moderna's FDA approval came almost five months after they submitted the information. And yes, number one, a lot of people want to know why it took so long. But also, I hope this adds trust to the general public that the FDA did a really good rigorous evaluation of the safety and efficacy data. Now, one hesitation we're hearing about already is that people out there want an option that isn't an mRNA vaccine. And so I do feel like Moderna's FDA approval is coming a little bit late for those people who are still unvaccinated and saying, hey, I'd like another option, which is why it's also crucial that we pay attention to Novavax, which is not mRNA based, it's a protein based vaccine that was submitted for emergency use authorization today. So even though we fully trust the mRNA's potential to protect us against severe illness, against Omicron or any variant. It's important that people have options out there and we keep that conversation going. And I do hope that we keep our eyes on global vaccine equity, which hopefully only increases as we get more approved vaccines. And, and doctor, cases are falling now across the country. It feels like Omicron has peaked. The USA as a whole is recording an average now of about 543,000 new cases a day. That's a lot. But it's down by more than 32% in the last couple of weeks. So does this mean we beat Omicron or survived it, I guess, endured it? Well, any way you want to word it, Terry, I think we're allowed to have a little bit of optimism locally and say, hey, we endured it. The peak has passed. But I think it, it's, it feels very narrow. It almost feels like a selfish worldview to say we've beaten Omicron when we still know so much of the world out there is at extreme risk from this. Not only because they don't have the same access to vaccines, but they don't have the same healthcare infrastructure. But now narrowing back to the United States, it is also hard to say that we've quote unquote beaten Omicron when we still, as you mentioned, have over 500,000 hospitalizations a day and we have 2,000 deaths a day on average. It just, it feels completely immoral to normalize that number. I think we're allowed to look forward towards the future and say that this might be the year, hopefully, when we get to an endemic status. But Terry, if we look at that map right now, that the, the map showing community level transmission, it is completely red. That means we have high levels of transmission, at least 100 per 100,000. And if you look at the CDC map right now, 99.75% of US counties are in that red or high transmission category. So even though cases are going down, we want to see start the, some of those colors start to change to say, OK, it's gone down and it's staying down. So, Doc, these government uh, shipped home COVID tests, they've been arriving to Americans in the mail now. When do you think is the best time to use these? I think there's three general criteria people should pay attention to. And the first is if you've been exposed to someone who has tested positive or they're symptomatic for COVID-19, you wanna wait a few days after that, not immediately. The CDC is seeing at least five days after that to test that. Number two, if you're feeling any symptoms, sore throat, fever, those telltale symptoms, loss of smell, things like that, go ahead and take a rapid antigen test also. And last but not least, if you're gonna meet with people, a gathering, especially those who are high risk or vulnerable, you also wanna make sure you take a test. But Kira, I think it's important that we differentiate the PCR test versus the rapid antigen test. There's there seems to be a lot of confusion between these two. The government is sending out rapid antigen tests, and those are really useful in terms of measuring your level of contagiousness. Are you infected in that moment in time? Whereas the PCR is gonna be looking for the presence of viral genetic material. The PCR test can stay positive for a lot longer, but the rapid antigen tests are gonna be your gold standard for actually determining, do I have enough virus to infect somebody else at this moment in time? And that's kind of the mentality people should take with these at-home tests. All right, Dr. Patel, great to see you again. Thanks very much for that as always. Thank you. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel and don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.